This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. The Swiss Family Robinson by Johann David Wyss. Chapter 7 I will spare you the history of the first day, said my good Elizabeth, spent in anxiety about you, and attending to the signals. But this morning, being satisfied that all was going right, I sought, before the boys got up, a shady place to rest in, but in vain. I believe this barren shore has not a single tree on it. Then I began to consider on the necessity of searching for a more comfortable spot for our residence, and determined, after a slight repast, to set out with my children across the river on a journey of discovery. The day before Jack had busied himself in skinning the jackal with his knife, sharpened on the rock. Ernest, declining to assist him in his dirty work, for which I reproved him, sorry that any fastidiousness should deter him from a labour of benefit to society. Jack proceeded to clean the skin as well as he was able, then procured from the nail chest some long flat-headed nails, and inserted them closely through the long pieces of skin he had cut for collars. He then cut some sailcloth, and made a double lining over the heads of the nails, and finished by giving me the delicate office of sewing them together which I could not but comply with. His belt he first stretched on a plank, nailing it down, and exposing it to the sun, lest it should shrink in drying. Now, for our journey, we took our game-bags and some hunting-knives. The boys carried provisions, and I had a large flask of water. I took a small hatchet, and gave Ernest a carbine, which might be loaded with ball, keeping his light gun for myself. I carefully secured the opening of the tent with the hooks. Turk went before, evidently considering himself our guide, and we crossed the river with some difficulty. As we proceeded, I could not help feeling thankful that you had so early taught the boys to use firearms properly, as the defence of my youngest boy and myself now depended on the two boys of ten and twelve years of age. When we attained the hill you described to us, I was charmed with the smiling prospect, and for the first time since our shipwreck ventured to hope for better things. I had remarked a beautiful wood, to which I determined to make our way, for a little shade, and a most painful progress it was, through grass that was higher than the children's heads. As we were struggling through it, we heard a strange rustling sound among the grass and at the same moment a bird of prodigious size arose and flew away before the poor boys could get their guns ready. They were much mortified, and I recommended them always to have their guns in readiness, for the birds would not be likely to wait till they loaded them. Francis thought the bird was so large it must be an eagle, but Ernest ridiculed the idea, and added that he thought it must be of the Bustard tribe. We went forward to the spot from which it had arisen, when suddenly another bird of the same kind, though still larger, sprung up close to our feet, and was soon soaring above our heads. I could not help laughing to see the look of astonishment and confusion with which the boys looked upwards after it. At last Jack took off his hat, and making a low bow said, "'Pray, Mr. Bird, be kind enough to pay us another visit. You will find us very good children." We found the large nest they had left. It was rudely formed of dry grass, and empty, but some fragments of eggshells were scattered near, as if the young had just been recently hatched. We therefore concluded that they had escaped among the grass. Dr. Ernest immediately began a lecture. You observe, Francis, these birds could not be eagles, which do not form their nests on the ground. Neither do their young run as soon as they are hatched. These must be of the gallinaceous tribe, an order of birds such as quails, partridges, turkeys, etc., and from the sort of feathered moustache which I observed at the corner of the beak I should pronounce that these were bustards. And we had now reached the little wood 
and our learned friend had sufficient employment in scrutinizing and endeavouring to classify the immense number of beautiful unknown birds which sung and fluttered about us apparently regardless of our intrusion we found that what we thought a wood was merely a group of a dozen trees of a height far beyond any i had ever seen and apparently belonging rather to the air than the earth the trunks springing from roots which formed a series of supporting arches jack climbed one of the arches and measured the trunk of the wood with a piece of pack thread he found it to be thirty-four feet i made thirty-two steps round the roots between the roots and the lowest branches it seemed about forty or fifty feet the branches are thick and strong and the leaves are of a moderate size and resemble our walnut tree a thick short smooth turf clothed the ground beneath and around the detached roots of the trees and everything combined to render this one of the most delicious spots the mind could conceive here we rested and made our noonday repast a clear rivulet ran near us and offered its agreeable waters for our refreshment our dogs soon joined us but i was astonished to find they did not crave for food but laid down to sleep at our feet for myself so safe and happy did i feel that i could not but think that if we could contrive a dwelling on the branches of one of these trees we should be in perfect peace and safety we set out on our return taking the road by the seashore in case the waves had cast up anything from the wreck of the vessel we found a quantity of timber, chests, and casks, but all too heavy to bring. We succeeded in dragging them as well as we could out of the reach of the tide. Our dogs, in the meantime, fishing for crabs, with which they regaled themselves, much to their own satisfaction, and to mine, as I now saw they would be able to provide their own food. As we rested from our rough labour, i saw flora scratching in the sand and swallowing something with great relish ernest watched and then said very quietly they are turtles eggs we drove away the dog and collected about two dozen leaving her the rest as a reward for her discovery while we carefully deposited our spoil in the game bags we were astonished at the sight of a sail ernest was certain it was papa and fritz and though Francis was in dread that it should be the savages who visited Robinson Crusoe's island coming to eat us up, we were soon enabled to calm his fears. We crossed the river by leaping from stone to stone, and hastening to the landing-place, arrived to greet you on your happy return. "'And I understand, my dear,' said I, "'that you have discovered a tree sixty feet high, where you wish we should perch like fowls.' but how are we to get up oh you must remember answered she the large lime tree near our native town in which was a ballroom we used to ascend to it by wooden staircase could you not contrive something of the sort in one of these gigantic trees where we might sleep in peace fearing neither jackals nor any other terrible nocturnal enemy i promised to consider this plan hoping at least that we might make a commodious and shady dwelling among the roots. To-morrow we were to examine it. We then performed our evening devotions, and retired to rest. End of chapter 7